Um, should we read the letter? Do y'all want to hear the letter? Again, this is breaking news. Okay, in the words of Port CEO Juliana Marler, Dear Port Commissioners, Please accept this letter as notice of my resignation from my position as CEO of the Port of Vancouver, USA. I wish for my resignation to be effective immediately. I have come to this conclusion after considering the impact of my decision making in this position of power. Specifically, I am ashamed of my decision to import pipeline infrastructure for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion which is being built in Canada. This decision was not aligned with the following official values of the Port of Vancouver, which are, keeping the air, land, and water around us clean is a top priority at the Port of Vancouver, USA. We believe that environmental stewardship and economic development can coexist. And as a part of our community, we are committed to doing our part. That's why we take a proactive innovative and integrated approach to sustainability, compliance, pollution prevention, and natural habitat protection. Juliana continues, I am aware that tar sands crude produces 15% more CO2 emissions than conventional oil and that exploiting the Alberta tar sands would mean game over for the climate. I am aware that mining tar sands involves creating toxic tailing ponds that can pollute groundwater and rivers, threatening drinking water and fishing. I know the Trans Mountain Pipeline would create a 700% increase in oil tanker traffic in the Salish Sea, threatening endangered orca populations. And importantly, I know that the pipeline would violate indigenous sovereignty on unceded lands. I apologize for allowing planet-destroying infrastructure to come through the port of Vancouver. I apologize for accepting shipments of infrastructure used to seal sovereign and unceded indigenous lands, specifically of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Squamish Nation, Coldwater Nation, and Sequetmik Nation. I encourage you to hold my replacement to higher standards that reflect the values of the port of Vancouver. Sincerely, CEO Juliana Marler. What do you think? <laughs> this is some news. Going to take letter of resignation into the building. coastline for fossil fuel resistance if we can't stop this pipe. That campaign's ongoing. I'm going to have some updates about that. And today we've got a number of wonderful speakers who are going to talk about different struggles in this region. 
uh, and we just want to highlight this place that we're in right now. As we look around here, this is the port of Vancouver. And through this port, it's supposed to be a green port. It's supposed to be a place where the transition, the just transition is happening. And a little over a year ago, we actually came to find out that this port was shipping tar sands pipe for the Trans Mountain Pipeline into the port, onto rail, and going up to Canada to be put in the ground. Now, people have been fighting this project, especially in Salewa Tooth First Nations community, right in the north of Vancouver in the Burnaby area. They literally are, are on, uh, they're looking right across the water to where this monstrosity would be built. And their leadership and the leadership of Kanahoos and many, many other communities across so-called Canada uh, have been asking for support, not just in that area, but everywhere in North America where this pipeline has any ties and connections. So the reason we're here today is because the port commissioners, the CEO, the port staff, and all those folks who make their headquarters right behind me here have some culpability and responsibility for approving this transition of pipe through the port. And given that this is a public port, given that this belongs to the people, we're here today to send a message to the port that never again we are not going to have oil, coal, and gas material moving through this port. So before we hear from some of our speakers, I want to introduce my friend and comrade. Okay, thanks Graham. Yeah, I'm Curtis from the Mosquito Fleet as well. Um, I, I want to thank you all for being here on this cold, loud street. It's not raining, so we got that going for us. Um, so the Trans Mountain Pipeline, really quick before we move on to our amazing speakers we have lined up for you. Um, who here has heard about the Trans Mountain Pipeline before? Hopefully most of you. It starts where there's an existing Trans Mountain Pipeline, right? It was built way back in the 50s from the Alberta tar sands all the way to the Sailor Sea, the Vancouver, BC. And what they want to do is they want to build a whole new pipeline. They call it an expansion, but it's a new pipeline. And if they get their way, it, about 900,000 barrels of dirty tar sands crude will be moved from Alberta to the Sailor Sea every single day under operation. 900,000 barrels a day of dirty tar sands. Y'all know what tar sands is? Diluted bitumen, they call it. It sinks. You can't clean it up. Also, there's this whole thing called climate change. Have you heard about that? Can we afford to be digging up more fossil fuels? No. And burning them? No. No. Even NASA, NASA, not a pro progressive, you know, <laughs> champion of, you know, progressive policy, says if you continue to develop the tar sands, it will be game over for planet Earth. That's coming from NASA. So it's it's a no-go, right? Well, what happened in the news this week? Did anybody hear? We had the, the leading court cases had been led by uh, First Nations in British Columbia, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, the Coldwater Nation, Sequetmik Nation, um, they've been leading this fight for years, and in the latest round of battles in the courts, they appealed the approval of this pipeline by the Trudeau administration on the grounds that they were not properly consulted, that the Canadian government had a duty to directly consult First Nations directly impacted by this project. And what did, what did the court say last week? We did a perfect job! They made an official ruling in the Federal Court of Appeals that the government properly consulted First Nations. We say that's a load of BS. It's not only a, a, a failure to consult, but it's a travesty of justice. The same institutions that own the pipeline are regulating themselves and taking themselves to court. So. Luckily, those of us around here, we're not just waiting around for the courts to do the right thing, are we? No. 
No, we're taking matters into our own hands, and we already have been. So, has everybody heard of what happened this summer and this fall in the Port of Vancouver when we found out that this dirty pipe was coming through? What did we do? Did we just stand around and look the other way? No, no we got out there. We took, took it to the streets and the rails and onto the water. We got out there with our allies from Rising Tide and other allies here, and we directly confronted the shipment of pipe through the Port of Vancouver. And we're going to keep it up, aren't we? Are we going to be back yeah. after today? Yeah. Are we going to let them get away with this? No. All right, all right. Well, I'm not here as a speaker. I'm here just as an MC, so I'm going to shut myself up real quick because we have way better speakers than myself. First off, we have a dear friend of the Mosquito Fleet, Paul Chokedon. Good morning, my name is Erin. I'm born in Portland, Oregon. I come from Mexica roots, Nahua and Mexico, as well in, as well as German and Choctaw roots on my mother's side. When I was younger, my father told me stories about growing up in Pula, Puebla. He spoke of a big body of water that he could fish and swim in. Today that water is gone. When I visited my family down there, I asked them, where is the water my dad spoke of? They said the corporations dried it up. In Tula, it is easier to get a bottle of tequila than it is to get clean drinking water. There, there are many stories like this. Stories of families, villages, and towns that no longer have access to clean water. And those stories will continue as long as these corporations exist. While I am grateful that we can come together today as one people, I am angry that we have to protest for clean water. I am angry that we have to fight corporations to protect life. I am angry that we, especially indigenous people, have to put our lives at risk just to ensure that humanity survives. We are in a climate crisis. We as humans cannot afford to make decisions based off of economic gain. We do not have the time to worry about profit. Those in positions of power need to listen to indigenous people, respect the land they're on, and make decisions that protect life. And if they can't do that, if they can't take action against this climate crisis, if they can't listen to the people whose land they're on and the people they're supposed to serve, then they have no business being in that position. And we the people have the right to take that power back from them. Water is life. You cannot drink oil, you cannot eat money. At what point did people forget that they need water to survive? We are taught to love and respect our mothers. When we are in our mother's womb, we are being created in water. So why is the majority of us not taught to love and respect the water as if it's our mother? When did we forget to respect life? If your mother was being beaten and exploited, would you not stand and fight for her? I ask you all today to keep protecting life when indigenous people make that call to stand up, to join the fight, you go and do that. Don't ever forget that life is more important than profit and politics. Don't ever forget to respect life. Every day, even in your home, when you shower, don't forget to thank that water for cleansing your body. That water is still sacred. When you drink water, even if it's from your tap, your sink, you still think that water is still sacred. Thank it for nourishing you, for giving you life. Talk to the water sing to the water it's it's life it's a spirit it has a spirit just like we have a spirit the tree has a spirit the orcas have a spirit the salmon has a spirit speak to it it hears you it wants to be spoken to how many people have forgotten to speak to the water how many people have forgotten to love the water imagine how lonely that feels to be forgotten to, to give life to nourish life and to be forgotten to be disrespected i can't imagine how that would feel so I ask you all today, when you go home, keep fighting, keep speaking about what's going on. Keep talking about the Dakota Access Pipeline. Keep talking about TMX. Keep talking about what's going on in, at Wet'suwet'en. Keep talking about the Wind River Pipeline that's happening over there. Keep talking about the violence against indigenous people, even to people who don't want to hear that. Keep talking about it. 
And don't forget, keep talking to the water, keep praying. Keep remembering that all the life, all, all that you see here has a spirit, even the land that we walk on. So don't forget that. And I just ask you, you know, I know it gets hard being a water protector, a land defender, a freedom fighter, whatever you want to call it. I know it's hard and it's easy to give up and it's easy to feel like these corporations are winning, like the government has more power over us. But the reason they take so much action to stop us, because we're powerful. We have the power. We outnumber them. They try to make us believe like we're minorities. But when we come together, we are the majority. We hold the power. We can overthrow the people who are bringing so much destruction to this land. You know? And if that's what it takes, if they don't listen to our demands, I, don't, I can't speak for all of us, but for me, I'm ready for that. If you, if you can't respect life, we're going to have to take you out of that position of power because that's all we have. We don't have time to waste anymore. We need to act now. There's no more waiting. The time is now. Right. So thank you for being here. Don't give up. Keep marching. Keep fighting. Keep speaking. Keep praying. Keep singing. Keep going. Thank you. You may know the Walla Walla. The real name is Wamulapam. Our tribe is uh, down the Great Columbia River that you call, we say, Chihuahua. The base of the Blue Mountains, our seated area. I have to kind of recompose myself because the beauty of these speakers that came before me really touched my heart. And I hope it has touched all of you. Those songs, those prayers have a deep-seated meaning for all of our people, no matter black, white, brown, when we walk on these sacred places, when we walk in the sacred lands, and we see these children, these four-legged ones, these winged ones, a lot of respect for the frontline people we say in the tea tights in our language and I'm I'm a broken language speaker my mother's people come from the Hepner Hardman area of Oregon those white people that were there took some of our native people in when we were distraught when we needed a place when all we wanted to do was go to pick berries and dig roots on our own land. My grandfather and grandmother had one of the first uh, midwife homes for poor white women so they wouldn't die in childbirth. My mother became a nurse and followed in those footsteps. She met my father who's family comes from the Cayuse, Walla Walla, Umatilla people. My father became head man of our tribe. He was sitting down with our elderly women when he started to walk a good path of sobriety and leading a drug-free life. Together I was the oldest of five children. I'm not an elected leader. I don't stand before you with any kind of credentials other than I am who I am and I try to speak the truth. My husband helps me carry on by allowing me to have a good war pony. My, my, my wonderful war pony that gives me across the country. My grandchildren. I love dearly my great-grandchildren and my eight children who you see sometimes with me but not today because they're trying to walk that path of being educated of trying to stay within our homelands and fight for other economic development try to fight for our own political struggles Oregon and Washington is really one to us. We claim parts of Idaho and up into Canada. When I first heard about the tar sands and the TMX, it was like hearing about 
the blown up mountains in Appalachia. I couldn't believe these kind of destructive forces were along for so long and I was so unaware. It's time for us all to wake up, not only to the oppression and the racism that happens right in our own backyard, but to what is also happening here in our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I went back to the climate march with my youngest daughter, who I may say now, she is three years a survivor of cancer at 27, and I always send her love. She always reminds me to breathe, Mom, when I start talking a little too fast. Breathe and keep calm. What I heard back there from all across the world was a cry for us to continue to rise up. So we talk about the coal, we talk about the oil. We can't forget about the nuclear because right here in your beautiful area across the river was Trojan. Please don't forget the fight, the good fight. Don't forget about the Columbia Generating Station down on the river. Whoops is a debacle, and we know that should be shut down, but it continues to operate. Don't forget about the SMNR, the small modular nuclear reactors that are being developed right across the river and backed by some of the biggest billionaires in the country. Yes, Gates does wonderful things, but guess what? He is backing small modular nuclear reactors as a farce, as a green farce to this energy crisis instead of a real sustainable future. <laughs> Frack gas, as we know, is streaming to the majority of our households to some degree. We all want to stay warm, I understand. But when we're out camped in the mountains, when we're up in the huckleberry fields of your beautiful sawtooth that we claim, when we're out root digging, up in the Bitterroots and the Khaush, we need to remember to have that sustainable growth, not just the profiteering in such a global way that we have no control over those corporations. We have power. We have power at the voting booth and it's an election year. We're gonna vote out 45, who has never been my president. Nobody wants to talk about it right now. We're gonna vote him out. Because you and I know, you and I know, if you read anything, what is happening by the shams of the EPA, by people who fought for the Clean Water Acts, we know that they're dismantling every kind of protection we could ever have and we have to get one of your people next to you, your neighbor that you may not disagree with, I mean, that you may disagree with. Go to them, talk to them, find some common ground. The struggle is real. 2050 is coming. I pray and hope, I will hope for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, as well as yours, that we're gonna turn this around. We're gonna see a different, life for us in the next 50 years. Katsyaya so much, Katsyaya. Thank you so much. Please, you don't need to clap. I really don't want you to clap. I want you to take it in your heart. I want you to hear those words and really listen. That's what it's truly about. That's why we're here on this ground. Thank you, Katsyaya. Oh, I know you can sing louder.